Thanks very much, Barry. Look, it's a great pleasure to be here with you this evening and uh, to follow um, what's been a fascinating couple of presentations uh, on two pathways uh, to energy futures, which I'm sure are going to, is going to generate an enormous number of questions from you here tonight. Um, I only have a short amount of time to talk to you, but what I want to do is try and stimulate some wider discussion and debate about you uh, amongst the audience about the human dimensions. Uh, of energy futures in the context of the pressing challenge of climate change. Before I do that, I just want to congratulate Barry um, on this terrific series. It's been you know, fantastically informative. Um, so congratulations to you, Barry, and to the um, uh, Environment Institute uh, and to um, Jordan and others who have been involved in, in this terrific series. I think it's been um, really stimulating and uh, incredibly useful in the South Australian context to, to generate a more informed debate and discussion around what sorts of energy futures we have. And as we've heard today and heard in the series, there are many different pathways that we might uh, want to travel over the course of the next decade in trying to um, uh, address the great challenge of climate change and reducing, reducing um, greenhouse gases over the next decade. And that, of course, is the great challenge, I think, that drives most of this debate at the moment. And I'm, I, I know that's of great concern to Barry. But for me, um, I'm a political economist, so I'm an unusual person um, in this series. Um, you probably haven't seen too many political economists or soci sociologists in this series, but I want to, um, to uh, make the case for the involvement of the odd social scientists in this debate because I think it'll be the media minds between scientists and social scientists that will forge ultimately the solution, that is the energy mix that we want to, um, to um, put in place over the next decade, 15 or 20 years, that will help uh, make Australia one of the great leaders, I think, uh, in showing the way uh, in uh, reducing our greenhouse emissions and meeting the great challenge that we have a, ahead of us uh, in trying to um, avoid the tipping points that Barry and others have talked about that uh, are very real um, in trying to address um, the reduction of greenhouse gases in the face of the, the enormous challenge of climate change. In front of you, you have a model of thinking about energy impacts and strangely, for some of you, it's got um, uh, social and cultural dimensions. You may not have thought about the social and cultural dimensions of energy, but they are clear social and cultural dimensions to thinking about energy impacts along with those more commonly understood environmental and economic impacts. And I want to put to you the idea that we, when we think about sustainable energy, we think about it in the context of a sustainable society. Um, at the end of the day, this, I think, is the great challenge for us. It's not just a technical question, and in my experience throughout this incredibly informative debate, I've heard many good technical solutions. Uh, it's not an absence of good technical solutions that's preventing us from um, attack, uh, dealing with this challenge. It seems to me that the great challenge is largely a, a political one uh, at the end of the day over the next decade. I'll come back to that at the end. Uh, in terms of what might be uh, a, a stimulating set of uh, figures for you to think about in what might be the political energy mix that might be possible in the Australian context. Uh, we'll just move to the next slide. Um, there are many things, many questions that you might want to pose um, that are social and economic questions in relation to thinking about the uh, energy futures that we might want to pursue in, in the future. I've just identified uh, seven areas that I could talk about probably for the next half an hour, but I only have five minutes, so you're going to have to, you're going to, have to um, look at some of these and think about them and, and digest them over uh, coming days and weeks as you, I know, will continue to contribute to uh, this important debate that we enter. But, the starting point is to talk about change and risk because if we take the climate if we take climate science seriously, then we have a fairly narrow um, window of opportunity to tackle the challenges that are ahead. That is to put in place an energy mix that will uh, deliver the greenhouse gas reductions that we need in the next decade or 15 years ahead. Um, and we also need to look at the risks associated with various different energy technologies. 
Um, and there are many. I mean, I, when we think about nuclear, of course, that's the most obvious risks. Of course, Ian's alluded to some of the historical risks associated with it, and, and of course, the risks are reduced as the technology has improved. But I'll say a little later that uh, I don't think that that's reflected in the perceptions of uh, Australians uh, and Europeans at this stage, despite the efforts of people like Ian and others to try and change perceptions in relation to nuclear. Uh, residual perceptions for good or for bad or for right or wrong are still there in relation, to uh, in relation to nuclear. I'll come back to that. Price and equity, it might be, um, uh, I think, a very real prospect that we enter a, a decade in which we see um, the uh, conflation or, should I say, the emergence of an energy-rich and energy-poor. We've talked about the information-rich and information-poor in Australian society and the establishment of the National Broadband, broad, broadband Network will test out the extent to which we might be able to uh, improve people's access to that transformative technology that is uh, the internet through the NBN. But in the same way, energy technologies um, need to be thought about in terms of their distributional impacts uh, on Australian society. And they have many distributional impacts, as we know from the experience in Britain and Australia over the last decade in terms of the growth of something that's called energy poverty. Um, and uh, the national electricity market um, uh, has some perverse impacts. Um, uh, the questions of uh, energy choices and energy technologies energy technologies take place in this extraordinarily complex system called the national electricity market, which I'm sure most, most of you understand extremely well. Um, and uh, uh, it is an extraordinarily complex market in which um, the energy producers and players uh, are operating in. I'll come back to that in a little while, but we must, must bear in mind the distributional impacts uh, in terms of access to affordable energy, um, and that's been touched on. Household energy efficiency uh, and income is an extraordinarily important point. We know that most of the subsidies that have been operating in relation to uh, photovoltaic in Australia have really benefited those uh, in, uh, on medium and higher incomes. It's very difficult for lower income people to ha have access to household photovoltaic. We need to learn that lesson uh, in the rollout of uh, alternative technologies over the next decade uh, and ensure that um, we take account of the distributional effects of any form of te technology, whether or not it be solar, uh, wind, nuclear or whatever. Um, and of course, those that have been the great, greatest losers in, rela in relation, relation to green affordab affordability, uh, in particular PV, have been renters, of course. There's been no incentives in place in Australia uh, for um, uh, people who are renting houses to install uh, photovoltaic on their roofs. Um, another perverse impact of the way in which incentive systems have operated in the Australian context. I want to just touch on three things before I close and then present you with a couple of slides that look um, at, uh, the, uh, at um, how uh, perceptions around different energy options play out in the minds of British people and Australians. One big question is, relation, is in relation to how different energy futures empower or disempower citizens and communities. And this goes to the heart of the role of government in the market. We talk about energy futures as if um, government uh, will do nothing more than then um, provide the incentives, uh, perhaps put a carbon price um, in place in which to provide certainty for investors and, and, and hopefully we'll see that in the not too distant future for, for the benefit of all people, um, all um, options that will be enormously beneficial. But I can see no future um, that will... Uh, um, uh, that doesn't involve government in a substantial role accelerating the rollout uh, of uh, renewables and other forms of low carbon energy technologies. If uh, we learn one lesson from history, uh, and that is um, that um, government uh, in uh, crisis situations, and if we recall um, our, our own situation here in South Australia, uh, in the 1940s, those of you who are, who, you are who, of you who are students of history would recall that it was only uh, with the national, nationalisation of the electricity industry in, here in South Australia did we see the substantial rollout of electrification to regions in South Australia. There was no great incentive um, otherwise for private producers to do so. Now, I think that 
uh, ultimately there will need to be a deal struck between private and public um, interests to ensure that the imperatives of climate change are met over the next decade uh, to meet the challenges of climate change. No market-based system alone, in my view, will address the imperatives that exist. Finally, the green economy. What a fantastic opportunity we have ahead of us over the next 10 or 15 years. This is the other side of the challenge of climate change, and that is the enormous benefits uh, from an industry development point of view and from a, an employment development uh, point of view that could flow from us investing in renewables and low greenhouse gas technologies. Um, I did a bit of a back of the envelope uh, calculation the other day in relation to the zero carbon plan um, and at its peak I estimate that it probably generated about 16 to 17,000 jobs uh, per annum here in South Australia. I haven't had the chance to do that in relation to other technologies but what we do know uh, is that, that um, those technologies that lend themselves to relatively intensive uh, manufacturing here in uh, South Australia to some extent, although we, we have to acknowledge that India and China will play a massive role uh, in, the, um, in, in years to come in the manufacturing of solar and wind technologies. There is a role for, for us here in South Australia. And, and just imagine this. Just imagine um, in the old Mitsubishi site, the hub for an East Asian uh, renewables industry development precinct at Tonsley Park. A site that's just you know, begging, just screaming out for us to, to, um, to be a national leader in relation to renewable uh, technologies, uh, clean, uh, green products and services. It is a terrific opportunity, a once in a life oppo lifetime opportunity to generate uh, sustainable industries and sustainable high wage jobs, high skill jobs. I'll skip the final part and just take you through to a couple of slides that I think are, are worth thinking about because um, they are important in shaping um, uh, the way in which we think about the politics and the strategic rollout of energy op options in the future. This is one survey on community attitudes to energy options in Britain, uh, the percent favourable and very favourable to various different types of energy options. Probably no surprise that solar is up the top there, followed by wind, hydro, gas, biomass, oil, coal and nuclear. Now this is in a country that of course has had a long history of nuclear and um, now look, I know and acknowledge that um, uh, attitudes vary enormously across Europe, but I show this British slide because uh, of a, uh, because I think it's more probably uh, relevant to the Australian context than perhaps showing a, a detailed slide of European attitudes uh, to um, uh, various different energy options. But we must think about this, I think, pragmatically uh, as we design energy futures for Australia. Um, and I'll just take us to the final slide, which just picks up on some Australian attitudes, and, and there are many surveys, well not many, there are a number of surveys that have been done, but this one um, done by the Australia Institute back in 2006 showed that two-thirds of Australians, around about 66%, were opposed to nuclear power plants in their local area. I mean, that's a pretty extreme question to ask in some ways, um, uh, a motive way of asking the question. Uh, um, uh, local area. That's a bit scary, but um, nevertheless, this is one of the surveys that we have available to us, and I think there's a need to, to, to do much more research in relation to the way in which Australians view nuclear. Um, uh, and there is a lot of that work happening in Britain at the moment as the old generation of nuclear reactors come up for renewal. Um, uh, and uh, those other points just pick up on various different other segments of perspectives on Australian attitudes as well. So I, I finish um, with, I think, a crucial point from a political economist's point of view. What is possible within the next 10, 15 years in relation to um, Australian attitudes, um, political, uh, the political climate, um, and say that any uh, energy futures need to be designed in the context of, of the art of the possible, but stretching out the imagination uh, to ensure that we've got the best energy mix uh, for the 21st century. Thanks very much.